Okay, well, because I'm starting. <laughs> Hi, this is Dan Lexi from Dan Schultz Outdoors, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. Hey y'all, I'm Johnny. And I'm Colleen. And, and we're, we're the Q Quest. Quest. And, and we, we want, want you to keep, to keep the, the adventures alive. alive. Cheers. Hey, this is Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat, encouraging you to keep the adventures alive. This is David from Beachley Ironworks saying keep the adventures alive. Adventures Alive. Hi, I'm Kevin Collins, the Happy Camper. Remember, keep the adventures alive. Awesome! Woo, buddy! Shug here! Keep the adventures alive. I am. Ethan here, the Avid Outdoorsy Guy, reminding you to keep the adventures alive. We're John and Aaron. Keep the adventures alive. Hey everyone, it's Kylan from Lure of the North, and I encourage you to keep the adventures alive. This is Sky North telling you keep the adventures alive and now on with the show well hey happy tuesday evening everybody and welcome back to another episode of canoe hounds outdoor adventure show a show that's going to bring you a lot closer to the great outdoors my name is dennis also known as canoe hound and if this is your first time joining us tonight thank you very much for joining in Hopefully you'll uh, enjoy the show enough to hit that subscribe button. And for everybody that are regulars, let's get that thumb, smash that thumbs up and get that thing, uh, that train rolling tonight. Uh, you know what? I do have a few announcements before we do get into uh, tonight's topic, just because I know I've been tardy and I know I've missed a few weeks um, and all, all for good reason. Life has just gotten very busy for, uh, for Canoe Hound of late and a lot of things have been going on. And really, you know what? Thank you very much for everybody's patience last week. The show that's happening tonight was supposed to have happened last week, but uh, due to my bad planning skills and forgetting to uh, to put a date into my day planner, uh, I realized that we had a very important family function to go to, and uh, it was a joyous event and uh, something that uh, made us all happy, although I think I may have contracted COVID from it. Uh, I'm on the tail end, and my wife are on the tail end of uh, having COVID. Uh, yeah, so I, I probably got another day or two of quarantining in me. Uh, I've got to get myself all in good shape because uh, we got other events to actually. I, today was my last day of the five day quarantine, but I just want to make sure because I want to protect people around me. So I'm trying to be a responsible guy here. But, anyways, thanks to uh, almost everyone who uh, who understood uh, that uh, you know, last week I had to take the week off for a reason. Uh, I had a couple of 
bad people out there and I won't even mention anything about too much about it, but yeah, you know what people you got to understand. This isn't my daytime job. Anyways, before we get too, uh, too much farther, I just want to acknowledge my, uh, my channel sponsors because without them in all honesty, this show probably would not be in existence. Uh, they're helping to, to carry the show right now. Uh, places like Algonquin Outfitters, our good friends over at Algonquin Outfitters, Many of you know, look, here we are right oh, over here. We got Algonquin Outfitters. Uh, you know what? If you ever head north, uh, make sure you stop at Algonquin Outfitters anywhere around um, around Algonquin Park. You know what? They got all kinds of great equipment, great expertise, and they have the knowledge and equipment rentals that you may need. So by all means, do check them out. Uh, they have four key locations located in and around Algonquin Park. Uh, our good friends over at Kid Products, makers of the Kid Twig Stove and Reflector Oven. You know how I feel about them. Uh, great products made right here in Ontario. Okay, right here in Ontario. Uh, if you're not in Ontario, then it's not right here for you. But anyways, uh, yeah, they are made Canadian, probably made in Canada. So let's just leave it at that. Uh, our good friends over at Hunter and Harris, uh, quality handmade paddles. Uh, Milan and uh, Milan does a great job of handcrafting these things. And uh, you know what? Definitely, if you're looking for something to propel yourself along the water, check out Hunter and Harris Paddles. Uh, one of our most recent uh, friends that we brought on to the show here is Novacraft Canoes. Uh, I've been paddling Novacraft Canoes since, well, geez, for a long time, a long time. Uh, I've owned several, and I still own one. And you know what? I love my Novacraft Canoes. And you know what? They've been uh, basically paddling the True North since 1970. That's like 50 years. 50 years. Yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Anyways, um, all their links can be found in the description below. You know what? Please support them if you can. Uh, I would greatly appreciate it as I'm sure they would appreciate it as well. So that would be a good thing. Uh, let's see some exciting news. Uh, this is, this is so exciting for me. Please mark it on your calendars because this is going to be a good time. Next Tuesday evening is number 100, number 100 show. This is going to be a fun evening. Uh, it's no, no particular topic. Uh, basically what we're going to be doing is we're going to be bringing back a bunch of past guests just to come on and give us some chat or some updates. Uh, we're going to have some good laughs and you know what? Uh, it's just going to be a party atmosphere and who knows, you never know. Dennis might have to go to the top shelf up there for, uh, for part of the evening just to, uh, to enjoy the festivities, uh, should be a really good time. But uh, most importantly, you know what? You know how I like to try and give stuff or, and give stuff back to my viewers? Well, thank you to our sponsors. Get this here. We have all kinds of great giveaways. Um, let's, uh, let's go through a couple of the things here. Uh, you, you're going to want to make sure you tune in. Anyways, we have some awesome prizes. A uh, thousand bucks, over a thousand bucks worth of prizes. We have, let's see here. Uh, from our friends over at Kid Products, we have a, a Kid Products prize package, which is going to be like a stove and some ferro rods and some other swag from them. Uh, a custom canoe paddle from Hunter and Harris Paddles. Uh, they will actually make it to the size that you want, and they're going to get that out to you. And you know what? You Whoever wins that, uh, you're going to be tickled pink because it's a, it's a beautiful paddle. Uh, Nova Craft Canoe Prize Pack, which includes also another Hunter and Harris canoe paddle, uh, but it, it's uh, marked uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of Swift, or of, uh, I'm sorry, my God, I, I shouldn't say that. Celebrating the 50th anniversary of Nova Craft Canoes. Okay, so uh, it's uh, that's also going to be a, another nice paddle, uh, as well as like hat and some other swag from Nova Craft. So by all means, uh, that's going to be a really nice prize to uh, possibly win. Uh, our friends over at Algonquin Outfitters, of course, they always contribute some great things. Uh, they will be on hopefully maybe next week with us for a little bit, and they can tell us exactly what the prize pack is going to be. But you know what? They usually sweeten the pot pretty good, so it's going to be a nice prize there. And, of course, uh, I'm going to have a bunch of swag to give away. Uh, Canoe Hound Adventures uh, prize pack. One of them will be worth $200. It's going to consist of a hoodie, a hat, a coffee mug, and uh, a bunch of other little things, you know, just to, to make up that $200, as well as maybe a bunch of smaller prizes as well. So you have to watch the show in order to win. So come and join us next Tuesday evening. Let's celebrate 100, well, three years and 100 episodes together. 
and let's have a good time. Let's have a really good time. Uh, on another front, uh, something new. Uh, everybody knows how I'm always sort of hinting or, or not really asking, but hinting towards uh, trying to garner some support for the channel. Reason I do this is because of the amount of time that we spend doing this. And there are all kinds of costs that are incurred with this, believe it or not. Uh, you know, I, I could spend anywhere from 10 to 20 hours setting up a show with no compensation. Okay, no compensation. That's my time away from my family and doing things like that. But I always try to do it where, you know, we've got channel membership set up. We have Buy Me a Coffee set up, uh, PayPal donations, uh, Super Chats, as you can see, a little dollar sign thing down underneath the chat if you're on YouTube. But uh, I, I like to try and make it so that you don't have to maybe pull money out of your pocket to, to donate to donate because I don't like to ask for it like that. It, it's really difficult and I'm kind of shy when it comes to that. But I try to set up other ways to do it. And one of the ways that I have set up is what's called affiliate programs. And if anybody is familiar with an affiliate program, basically you align yourself with a company and you get what's called affiliate links. And when people shop through your links, you basically gain a small commission on any sales that that are made through that. And I had one for quite a while with Amazon. People do buy from time to time on there. It makes me a few dollars here, a few dollars there, which is uh, always very helpful when it comes to it. But uh, I've just finished setting up one with uh, Keen Footwear. Uh, for anybody that might be looking for Keen Footwear, maybe you're a fan of Keen and uh, you shop their, their website anyways to buy products. You can now do it through an affiliate link and Dennis will get a small commission for any sales. The shopping experience is exactly the same. Any returns, like everything, it's exactly the same. You're just going through a specific link to get to theirs, which tells them it's coming from Dennis. Uh, the other one that I have a big affiliation with now is uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op. And uh, everybody in Ontario and Canada pretty much know about MEC. So uh, MEC is another affiliate and same deal there. Same deal there. If you shop through their affiliate links, Can You Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show gets a small... Uh, commission based on that and like i said it's you helping out the channel by basically just shopping for stuff you're going to buy anyways if you want to know where these affiliate links can be found if you just look in the description below you will find i have the description set up or you can actually go to my website canoehoundadventures.com and you can go into the link section and you'll see at the bottom there's different ways that you can support the channel any support is greatly appreciated and it's uh that's uh very good thing. Uh, you know what? Right here, right off the top, I can see. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Glenn and Carol. Let's see. I, I, I see I got some super chats coming in. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so greatly appreciated. That's uh, It's not 100% necessary, but the support does go a long way. A lot of this support is probably going to go towards sending out all, all the prizes for next week's show. So that's a, a pretty big expense anyways. Uh, anyways. Enough of that babble. Uh, just a few more quick things before we get on with tonight's topic because it's a really cool topic and I've been wanting it to have this for quite a while. Uh, thanks to all my uh, channel members. Thank you very much uh, for all of you that do support the channel. That's great. Um, for any information on what's coming up on the show or, or you know, if you're unsure if there's going to be a show the next week, check my Facebook page at, at um, Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show and I always have posted on there, you know, if there's if there's an issue that I can't have the show or what's coming up and I post all the links on there and stuff like that. So it's the best way to keep up to date. Anyways, we have a great topic for you tonight. Uh, we have a great guest here that uh, I met uh, recently. Uh, he's someone I met actually a couple weeks ago, but I met him on a couple of different occasions at the Toronto out or Toronto sportsman show. And uh, he's a vendor there. And uh he, he sells natural chaga products and uh, provides information and education on, on the chaga mushroom, right? Uh, as a chaga consumer myself, and you know what? I am actually drinking chaga tea tonight with some of his chaga maple syrup in it. Hmm. We'll get to that in a bit. That's hot. Wow. Uh, anyways, uh, I thought it'd be great to have him on the show to educate us, share information, speak of the benefits of chaga, and perhaps expel any myths about chaga. Uh, please welcome the former Minister of Natural Resources and the CEO of Chaga Health and Wellness, Mr. Jerry Ouellette. And there's the button. Hey, hey Jerry, how are you doing tonight? Life is good, thanks. Great to be on. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Well, you know what? The pleasure was all mine meeting you uh, at the show. Um, I have to thank my uh, my buddy some kid products because they actually come and told me that you were at the show and they oh, said, yeah. you got to go talk to, to Jerry. And it yeah. worked out well because, hey, here you are. 
Yeah, no, it's it's good. Uh, I enjoy doing the show. It's really good to meet a lot of people because you get a lot of different perspectives and people will bring things forward and you you can have some good dialogue and learn a lot of stuff at a lot of these shows. And that's one of the reasons I enjoy doing them. I've been doing yeah. shows since the early 80s and it, it goes a long way. I've been at the Sportsman Show with a lot of different companies, a lot of different ways over the yeah. years. And still enjoy going back to it. Cool. So tell, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. I know uh, okay. you have a, an interesting back history with uh, the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources, right? Yeah. Uh, you've done a couple of really interesting things with that there. I'll let you tell it, but um, and then we'll get into the Chaga Talk. Sure. Well, there's just to give a bit of a background, some of the things um, I was responsible for reintroducing elk into the province of Ontario. I negotiated, uh, went down, met with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, who is the agency that was handling all the elk in Elk Island, Alberta. And what happened in Elk Island is they have a, a location there where there's no predators. So the elk end up starving to death in most cases, and they die of starvation. So Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation came in, made a deal with them that they would live trap, test and transfer any elk to any jurisdiction throughout North America that wanted it in order to reduce the populations in a natural way. And Ontario was one of the ones that uh, was a recipient of quite a few animals. And we had, I think it was five locations ended up being total where elk had been released. Bancroft would be the closest one to this part of the province. But there's like that close, huh? I didn't yeah. Know. Yeah. Bancroft was a big fight. Uh, none of the, I wasn't the minister at the time when I did this. And when, when we first did the negotiations, most of the districts really weren't, didn't want it. They, it was an added burden for them to be managing another species when according to them, they have a tough enough time managing the species they have now, let alone add an elk into it into the picture as well. And we, it was very interesting because every single elk that came in was radio collared, and we did work with every one of them to find out uh, habits and where they went. And it, we introduced a number of things. First, when the first batch came, um, they have a lot of, when they transfer a lot, they have a lot of fatalities, which doesn't go over that well, obviously. So we, Ontario, developed transport trailers to minimize or uh, quite frankly we almost eliminated i think we did eliminate any of the fatalities in the transfer of the elk coming in we had like basically we were padded trailers with padding on the bottoms rubber padding and a bunch of stuff like that and very very and the way they were we had teams that would drive the trailers from alberta loaded with elk first they would they go through they get trapped into a pen drawn in by food and then they would load them into kind of stockyard sort of things and then feed them into the trailers. And we brought them out that way. Anyways, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation uh, benefit, to, as did we, by getting a lot of elk in the province of Ontario. So we got quite a few. Well, some of the other things, oh, sorry. Don't go finish. Yeah, no problem. Sure. Um, some of the other things, I, I invented a system of, called we called it a classroom hatchery. So and I worked with uh, some, actually some plumbers and some people that own pet stores, and we developed a system. See, when you rear wild salmonoid, or in our case, rainbow trout, although we did do a batch of brown trout, we uh, the problem is keeping the water cold, not like a regular aquarium. So when we first started it, we had heavy-duty pumps going through coolers filled with ice, and what would be called eyed-up eggs, and what that means is when the rainbow trout eggs came, we would deposit those in an aquarium, and you can see the eye in it. That's why they're called eyed up eggs, which means they're going to hatch in a couple weeks, two, three weeks. But every twice a day, we were going in to fill these coolers with ice to keep the water cold, to keep the temperature down. That didn't work. Mm -hmm. So then what we did was we got we got coolers, of the, the electric coolers that you can plug into the wall, and we ran the lines through that, and that didn't work. So eventually, uh, what we did was we modified water chillers that you can get at uh, your local stores and fed the water through the water chiller and then back in, and that worked perfectly. Hmm. And we ended up with uh, a couple of dozen schools that all reared rainbow trout, and we release those every year. And we probably uh, put in, uh, well, well over 100,000 uh, sa salmonoids, which would be uh, trout or salmon or in our case, rainbow and brown trout. Interesting. Plus, interesting. Yeah, there's a bunch of other stuff. You know, one of the other things that was kind of interesting was, this was before I was minister as well, I was doing some work up in um, 
Fort Severn, not Port Severn, but Fort Severn, where Hudson's Bay, Manitoba, and Ontario come together. And what happened was um, um, I had an individual who was, uh, was sent by the Chinese government. They wanted to do some Aboriginal tourism. And Fort Severn is the only place along Hudson's Bay that actually has a motel on it where people can actually stay. So I took them up there and I done some uh, did some work with them previously. And we got up there and so we had one guide who was going to take us out on Hudson's Bay. Now we were about two hours late getting going. Anyway, so we got on a freighter canoe and we head on the bay, but now the water, the tide is going out. And so we have to keep going farther and farther out on the lake on on Hudson's Bay because it's very shallow. So we are so far off, you can't see the shore. That's how far out we are in the mud flats now. And it's 11 o'clock at night. One of the, my buddies brought a pair of binoculars, so we couldn't see where the river mouth was to get back in. So I told Greg was his name. I said, watch, they put up a, a platform at the river mouth. I said, use your binoculars to find the platform. Anyways, we're driving along in the, in the freighter canoe, and we're bottoming out constantly. I have to go out farther and farther. We're over five kilometers out offshore. And I'm looking over, and I said, what was that? So we're going along a little bit farther. And I'm watching over there. Up, and it stands a polar bear. And the polar bear stands up, and he's watching us, and he's got – he's – angling himself to cut us off. So I'm looking, I go, I saw a polar bear. No, you didn't see a polar bear. I'm sure I saw a polar bear. So right over there, watch over there. And all of a sudden I'm going to go, keep watching, keep watching. All of a sudden the bear stands up. It got a boat and it kept coming at us. And we're trying to drag the canoe farther out to get deep enough so that we can run the motor. And it got to about uh, maybe a little bit more than uh, the width of a hockey arena from us before it got us, before we got away. There, people don't know we have a large population of polar bears in the province of Ontario. We have seals, we have walruses, we have all these things that most people don't even realize are out there. Anyways, the end result was when I became minister, I actually almost doubled the funding for polar bear research in the province of Ontario. Interesting. So, Very yeah. interesting. So I have to ask you. Sure. I was out hunting through the forest one day. One day, it sounds like letter candy episode. I was out hunting through the forest one day, and I come across this thing sticking out the side of a white birch tree. Yep. Can we talk about this? Sure, sure we can. All right. So what is that? So <laughs> that's a chaga. Inotanus obliquus is the Latin name for it. And it's a, it's a rare mushroom. It's actually a conch, which is the mushroom family. So first of all, I'll clear up one thing. A mushroom, um, mushroom is the fruiting body of a fungi. Okay, and a fungi has three main components, the mycelium, or the roots, and then you have the fruiting body, which is the mushroom, and then you have the seeds, which would be the spore. So if you're like an apple tree, you've got the apple roots, the apple itself, which would be the fruiting body, and the spores coming off the it, which would be the seeds that are in the air everywhere we go. And that's why they say, when you're picking mushrooms in the in the wild to use a basket, it's because when you're walking with that basket, if you put it in a bag, you're actually spreading spores or seeds of the mushroom throughout the forest or wherever you're harvesting from. That's why they recommend baskets so that you can actually continue to spread them out in other areas. Mm -hmm. So Chaga, and maybe I should just explain what happened was when I was minister, I hired a guy from Northern Ontario, Pierre. And Pierre owned a forest harvesting company, and it was rather unique. You could almost, if you went into one of his areas a year and a half after he clear cut it, you wouldn't know a tree was gone because he had the technology and the machinery to go and take out every mature poplar and only every mature poplar uh, that would be like 90 years old and leave the rest of the forest. And because they were using special rubber tires as opposed to treads or um, chains, it was a soft touch, and it came back very quickly. Anyways, when I was done with all that, and he knew I was looking to get into something, he called me up. He said, Jerry, he said, yep, what's up here? He said, have you found anything yet? I said, no, I'm looking. He said, look into this Chaga. And like a lot of people, I said, what's that? He said, if I told you, you wouldn't believe me. He knows I'm a little bit obsessive compulsive. So 
I started doing my research on it. I can't believe what I'm reading. Yeah, right. Cancer, arthritis, diabetes, blood pressure, MS. So I collected it for a year and a half and gave it away to friends. One of the guys I gave it to was Bob, a friend of mine. Now, Bob had open brain surgery twice, open heart surgery three times, and over a dozen heart attacks. And I drove him to the hospital during one and was dealing with stage four prostate cancer. And I said, Bob, I said, this is supposed to be good. You know, you might want to be something to try. He says, Jerry, he said, for me, every day I get up is a good day. I'm going to try it because what do I have to lose? <laughs> so he goes in for his oncologist checkup three months, comes back. And he says, you know something? The oncologist says, Mr. Holden, we don't know how to explain this to you, but your stage four prostate cancer is all normal now. We haven't begun any therapy with you yet. We don't know how this is possible. And you'd have to meet Bob. But Bob would just kind of like, oh, I wonder how that happened. He goes back in three months again, the exact same response. Another friend of mine, Doug, Doug had two forms of cancer. He had multiple myeloma, which is the blood bone cancer, bladder cancer. He was had arthritis and was diabetic. Neutralized both cancers, eliminated his arthritis, and stabilized his blood sugar. When I started getting responses like this from friends, I, I realized, you know something? There's something to this. And then so we started from there, and we just expanded to where we are now, where we probably have over 3,000 hours of research into it now. Probably worldwide, I would say close to a thousand studies from all around the world. It's hard to find a lot of stuff, but uh, when you start going, particularly in Asia, there's quite a bit of research there. And if people are looking for more information, PubMed is a great place to look up research studies on that, and they can read it. And, and if you're not used to reading a research study, read the abstract or the opening paragraphs and the conclusion. That'll give you enough of the research to understand what it's talking about. And I started from there and like we talked earlier, Dennis, that we're out in the bush and my buddy, I started looking for it. I said, Pierre, I've looked like 2,000 trees. I haven't seen any yet. He said, don't worry, it'll come. It'll come. And I keep looking and looking and looking. And all of a sudden, I said, I, I, I think I see one there. And it just started from there. And it's about, I've seen a number of studies. The, the one that I usually uh, quote is about one in 10,000 birch trees will produce one of these. Wow. Yeah. So we spend a lot of time looking in the bush and we we try to do we do a sustainable harvest and make sure we leave enough of the the roots or the mycelium on the tree to allow it to continue to grow. And I've got about three dozen test trees that I monitor the growth on an annual basis. And not only that, but uh, we're developing, we're growing it in Petri dishes to see if we can inoculate wild trees. And I haven't got a growth median yet that I can utilize to take it from the Petri dish to put it in the tree to get to see if we're going to get results. But part of the problem is it's really slow growing. It only grows about half an inch a year, I find, in the moist areas. But the higher dry areas, we find it grows about three quarters of an inch a year. So it oh, takes a so little drier, it grows more? Yeah, it, it's, it seems oh, wow. to grow quicker. I have some friends that try to tell me that what they do is they look at the elevation where they actually harvest theirs from to see if elevation is actually one of the determining factors on where it'll grow. Now, we only harvest off birch because all the medicinal studies I've done, I've read all indicate it's always been birch. But we have found it on other trees such as ironwood. We find it a lot in ironwood. Poplar. Um, pin cherry I, I found it on as well. And then I understand maple, although I haven't found it on maple. But I also found what I believe was some on beech, but that's not confirmed because I didn't harvest it at the time. I didn't have our climbing spurs to get up far enough to, to be able to get it off the tree. So we harvest it, cure it, process it now, and make it available to people to help with uh, some of the uh, the issues that we mentioned earlier on. Cool. Yeah. Now, just curious. Now, I I, I heard you, like uh, a lot of what you said there. You had mentioned in the uh, in the presentation that you did at the Sportsman Show, and these these individuals that like you know it, it sort of we'll say eliminated their cancers and their blood pressure like how how much of a time period are we talking we're, we're not saying like hey have a cup of chaga and you're boom you're healthy it, it, it it's a regiment right yeah so first of all we're not a doctor can't give medical advice and we don't right. all we do is we provide individuals with the research studies on their own and we let them know what other individuals informed us of what they've done to to be successful and what we found is that Depending on what people are dealing with, they normally, if uh, according to Health Canada, the only cautions are for pregnant and breastfeeding females. However, some of the research that I find indicate that people are taking diabetic medication and or heart medication as well need to watch because for a diabetic, individuals 
can lower their blood sugars too low uh, when they're taking the medication. So I check and find out how often they check their blood sugars and, you know, uh, advise them. And I also be, used to bring out Dr. Couture with me who would talk to people about it from a medical ba um, perspective on what to do and how to do. And the same thing goes for blood pressure because it can lower it too low. So what happens is, is I usually suggest to people if they have, for example, arthritis, and there's basically three arthritis. There's rheumatoid, there's osteo, and there's psoriatic arthritis. Rheumatoid is inflammation-based, and there's a lot of in inflammatory um, materials. It eliminates inflammation in the chaga itself. So rheumatoid arthritis, I usually have suggest to people to have two cups of tea a day. The darker it is, the stronger it is uh, when you're brewing your tea. And then have it eight hours apart because there's uh, some studies out of Manchester, England and Edinburgh, Scotland that indicate that uh, the body naturally flushes it out over an eight hour period. Now, for individuals dealing with things like cancer, uh, what you showed me earlier, Dennis, about the chunks you were using, about the, the yep. size of a walnut or an acorn. Okay. Yeah. Might have shown it down. That's here. Yeah, it's about the size I, I like to deal with here. Yeah. And you've got some black on those. I can't see any. Yeah. Of the, uh, these are a lot the of inside here. chunks. I'm getting chunks of chaga all over my computer. But yeah, I uh, I tend to try and uh, keep most of the black because yeah. it's that's the good stuff, right? Well, yeah. And I've met people uh, from uh, BC, for for example, uh, who, who try to. to believe only the black is good. And then I met people in Wilberforce, Ontario that say, well, the hardest part that we have, and I've met quite a few of these, so how do you get all that black stuff off to get down to the good stuff? And I explained to them, no, 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 you need the, you need both components in it. So yeah, so a lot of the, the darker material will turn the tea very, very dark. And it almost, it turns jet black. And usually I suggest individuals so long, uh, and if, if they're taking or dealing with an oncologist or radiation or chemotherapy, that uh, they need to discuss it with their oncologist because chaga is a natural blood thinner as well. And when you're doing chemo, you're dealing with um, thinning the blood as well, and it could be problematic. So I usually suggest not individuals that, although there's there are some studies that talk about it, but nothing that verifies that. So they just watch on that. And they, they would have three cups of the tea a day, so three um, three cups and again, one every eight hours in order to maximize the input in the body. And it takes usually, for example, for arthritis, it's not like Western medicine where you take a pain pill and the pain goes away. It's more a case of, I've been having a cup of tea for, you know, uh, every day for a couple of weeks now. And they wake up and realize, I never noticed all the arthritis in my hands all, all normal now. And yeah, it's... it. it takes time for it to work. It's not like take a pain pill, pain goes away an hour later. It's more or less you wake up and you realize I never noticed, but it's all gone. And that's how it works. It, and it allows the body to heal itself. So one of the ways it works with rheumatoid arthritis is eliminates the inflammation in the body and then allows the body to heal itself. And a lot of times, once the body's healed, you don't want to drink it anymore. You don't need to, but you can use it as a preventative as well. Yeah. I, I personally, I like since I, I've discovered the benefits of chaga, I quite literally, I always have a pot on the stove and the, with the chunks in it. And yep. because I, I've under, from what I understand, it can actually, you, you can brew it and then you top it up and brew it and top it up until the color's almost all gone and you still have some properties. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So long as you have color coming out of the, the chunks. And after the, the second or third time you brew a batch, and normally what I tell people is if they take about, about 40 grams of chaga, both the internal and the external parts. Uh, the, the the internal would be this here, stuff here. Put your full screen so you could show that. Oh, that's okay. There we go. So that's a small one. Yep. That would be the average size a person would normally find. Yep. And it sits on a tree basically like that. And so about uh, 40 grams of that in a crock pot. And if you put that crock pot on for 8 to 12 hours, you'll get a, a large extracted uh, component out of that. And then you can put it in the fridge or just gently reheat it or drink it cold. And you can mix cream, sugar, honey, lemon, milk, whatever you want with it. It doesn't take away from the medicinal properties. But with that though, you'll get several 
crock pots full out of those those chunks. Right. And what you can do is after about the second or third time, the chunks will be soft enough. You can cut them halves and quarters and get another time or two out of them again. I the never ever thought about that. Yeah, because they do get kind of soft after they've been sitting in the, in the water for quite a while, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. when people harvest, that's one thing I try to tell them is that within harvesting, within 24 hours, get it to the size about what you're using there yeah. um, or a walnut size. And then let it dry because after it dries, it's really hard to process. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have I'm gonna discover that with this piece that I've got here because this one's been drying. It's I, I put it on a rack in the garage and it's it's dry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, they lose about fifty five percent of their weight from the time you harvest them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, because when you cut them, when you cut them off, they actually like they'll stain your hands. Yeah, right? the, the the even so, on the outside they're moist and inside they're moist and. Yeah, so I can tell the time of year. It's either spring, summer, fall that you that it was staining your hands, right? Yeah, this is this is a fall piece, this particular piece. Yeah, so early. let's go back to the beginning then here with uh, sure. with the chaga. Like, how what are the proper like how how do you properly identify a chaga? Uh, I told you about the first time I thought I found chaga, and it turned out to be a birch burl, right? <laughs> so what, what's the proper way to actually identify chaga? Well, that's the difficulty is, is that there's a lot of other component, a lot of other fungi out there um, or fruiting bodies that when they start to decay and die off, they will start to look like chaga. So we mentioned uh, when we spoke earlier about hoof conch and hoof conch, aged hoof conch actually turns and gets that black exterior on the outside as well, as yeah. do some of the other ones, uh, whether it's birch polypore or a number of others as well, that will actually look like it. It, to be honest, it takes time in the bush to do it. It's not, it's not like, well, look for this sign, look for that sign. You'll need to find, first of all, make sure it's the right tree. Um, there are a lot of other trees that other ones that look like something like chaga. But if you stick with your birch, you either yellow or white or any of the strains of white, uh, you're more likely to find the correct um, chagas that will be out there. And it's not something that I can say, well, if you take it apart, it has this, because a lot of the other ones that we discussed earlier had that amber colored inside. So even the, the uh, hoof conch and all that, when you take those out, they'll have that color on the uh, on the inside of it. And hang on here. I'll even get a bigger one here. See, there's a, a monster. <laughs> uh, that's, that one's a good size one. Yeah. So that one there would be about, uh, let me see, that's about... Uh, Mo, 26, 28 years old, that one there. Wow. And so, but a lot of those other ones we're talking about all have that ombre colored on the inside. And they have a, because it's dying, they have that dark exterior that looks something like this, although it's it's more a, a specific kind of scaly pattern. If, uh, if when you see it out there, you'd be able to, and it takes a while before you can actually, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, it was, several thousand before I even found the first one. And then it just started from there. And then after that, you kind of go through the bush now and it's just like, oh, there, over there. And uh, so, but if you're going to look for it, take binoculars with you, unless you want to do a lot of hiking, because we... Oh. oh. Did Jerry freeze up here or am I frozen up here? Oh, Jerry froze up. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Jerry. Uh, everybody, oh, there he is. He's back. He's back. Yeah. So, so yeah, so uh, you had your finger up, uh, take a pair of binoculars with you. Yeah. To do a lot of looking. Yeah, I, I, find, I find whenever, uh, I've seen some of the nicest piece of chaga, and it's out of my six foot, one and a half inch reach, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Or higher than that, seven foot, because I, I am six one. But you know what? Uh, yeah. So I, and I, I look at them and I go, you know what? You're that high. You deserve to, to stick around, right? So oh, yeah. most so, of my harvests are all down uh, ground level, right? Yeah. I'll show you a really big one there. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Let's see here. See there? Yeah. Looks it looks big, but to be honest, that one and this one's probably in around the uh, 44, 46 year old age mark. But that one that was younger. This one's hollow. You can see oh, it yeah. 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 This one's hollow. So, but the, that's the thing to look for is that amber colored on that with that kind of a finish on it that you can see. 
And and I tried to actually, um, I was out tapping, uh, working with the, uh, the maple bush yesterday, and I tried to get some hoof conk off, but I didn't have anything to get it off in an effective way. Right. Otherwise, I would have brought some other ones in to show you what else, what not to look for. Yeah. Over uh, I'm going to get was... caught up here on a couple of quick questions that have been popping up in the chat so sure. that we can try and keep up with them. Uh, let's see here. Gord, Gord Keith is asking, uh, why is chaga so often found on birch rather than other species just mentioned? Like why, why specifically does it seem to grow mostly on the white birches or, or the yellow birch? Well, we find probably as much on ironwood as well, but we only harvest off birch because that's where all the medicinal studies indicate that, that they've done them from. And we believe there are specific species of trees that will actually attract the spores and the conditions are right that will allow the growth of the Inotonus obliquus or the chaga inside that tree. And birch is probably the most popular one. And we find that the way it gets into the tree is um, a couple of ways. So if a branch breaks off or a branch on another tree breaks off and scores the birch bark, we find the spore body gets in that way and then it expands from there. But uh, the reason birch is because that's where the conditions are for the, the, the right growth materials to allow it to grow and to expand from there. Mm -hmm. I, I thought maybe it was just because like a birch tree is really a miracle tree, right? Yeah. You, you think about it, it, it's white, so it's easily identifiable in the bush, right? Uh, the the syrup is good, you know, the fact that it has chaga, the oils in, in the in the bark, yep. uh, you know, great for fire starters, uh, you know, the they used it for birch bark canoes. And it's just really a miracle tree, isn't it? So it's uh, well, and see, it extracts certain things out of the birch bark itself. And you mentioned the oils. Mm -hmm. Now, there's something else I actually have seen where some of those oils have been used as an insect repellent as well. Um, so what they do is they will they will steam a lot of the uh, the bark itself mm -hmm. and ex do an extraction on a kind of a wok uh, wog kind of thing, and uh, they will get this black. Um, material coming out, which stains your hands when you took the chaga, yeah. as you mentioned earlier on, and then that actually works as a good insect repellent. But yeah, the, the the material inside and it extracts certain things out of the birch bark and converts it into things and the birch tree and the things that are beneficial to people. Those would be the main reasons. Right. So, in your opinion or knowledge, is is chaga off a white birch or a yellow birch better? Is there any difference? I have not seen a difference yet. And and I do. I have um, specifically done batches of white only and yellow only to see if there was anything that could be identified being specific. And I have not seen anything yet that indicated that there was any difference at all. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Gord Keith is on a roll here because his next question was, uh, any truth to chaga being beneficial for individuals with curly hair or help preventing baldness, most important for his situation? <laughs> no, I haven't seen any studies that talk about that at all or any um, any indications of anything that even reflects any of that. Um, the, the one thing that I did see is I had a person out of Barry, and I had another one out of Peterborough that actually um, – their hair reverted back to the normal color. Their gray hair was yeah. completely gone after they started using it. No kidding. Yeah, they, there's only been two individuals that have actually brought it to my attention. I think one posted uh, on my website uh, that uh, my son noticed that my all my gray hair was gone. Never even thought about it. And then after he started doing it, using the chaga. Yeah. So, but it's nothing not, it's not working for me, man. It's not making mine grow back. And I drink, I drink quite a bit of chaga. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Another one here by uh, Mustang Seven Seventy Four asks: Once harvested, how long does chaga last for? So, if you want to harvest it, put it in the freezer. It'll go dormant, and then it'll last indefinitely. It'll go dormant, and then and there's a lot of people that say that you should be harvesting it only in the winter time. But when we, um, our family has miti status. And so at powwows, when we talk to the uh, the medicine individual or the shaman that are there, they harvest all year long. So if you're going to harvest it and you want it to, as we talked about it, we cure it or dry it. It loses about 55% of the weight. And then if you want to have it last a long time, put it in the freezer. And we have not seen an expiry date on any of the ones that have been in the freezer for years. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I'm one of the people I, I, 
harvest basically what I think I'm going to need. I'm, I'm yep. starting to actually get good thing. I got that chunk because other than that, I'm done, but uh, yeah, I'm starting to get low on my chaga supply and I, I try to harvest it. Just what I think I'm going to need. I don't want to uh, yep. um, over harvest because you know what other people might be looking for and like, you know, really oh, yeah. how much of the stuff do you need? Right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I see a lot of individuals harvesting and, and they don't leave anything left on the tree. And I met two individuals. One, uh, they said, you mean you're supposed to leave some on the tree? And they said, oh, yeah, you leave it on the tree. It'll continue to grow. Mm -hmm. See, it's a symbiotic relationship with the tree that's not beneficial to the tree. Although, well, that's my chocolate lab right there. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, that's a, that's a living piece of chaga. Look at that. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we're, we're okay. Go talk to mom. <laughs> so. With, with that being said here, the, we'll move on to the next question I had written down here then um, sure. basically was uh, how, how is chaga, chaga best harvested? Uh, I've heard like, you know, people, I use a saw. Uh, some people that's chisel fine. it out of the tree. Some yeah. people just break off what they need and, and kind of that's that's about it. Yeah. Can, yeah. Is it good if it's on a dead tree? Well, see that there's a lot. Most of the time we don't harvest off a dead tree. Okay, um, what we do is, and if you find it on a dead tree, or a lot of people find it on a fallen tree, that they, um, when you take it in your hand, like that one that you have there, yep. or this one that I had here, and if you squeeze the end of it with your hand and it crumbles and falls apart, then it's not good. Okay. okay? So even if it's on a dead tree, it still could have retained enough of the moisture out of the tree before the tree died to allow it to continue to live. And although we suggest not harvesting off a dead tree, uh, simply because it's a little harder to identify, but you'll find it crumbles in your hand right on the tree or beside it afterwards. Uh, and those ones, uh, they've lost their, their additional beneficial properties to it. So live trees is the way to go. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, you know what, I have experienced that where I found a piece on a dead tree one time. That's why I wanted to ask. And, and it, it did exactly what you said. It just, it kind of crumbled. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it didn't go, it didn't go with me. So I it just, it felt like it was rotting. Right. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So what, what is the best way to, to cut it off a tree? Like oh. I noticed the pieces you have, have, have like mine's nice and smooth. Cause I sawed it yep. off and I, I typically leave like, you know, uh, half an inch to three quarters of an inch sticking out of the tree. Yeah. So we try to leave uh same side sort and, um, Fortunately, I don't have any of the slides that I can show you, but um, when it'll turn and I've monitored the growth when it's left uh, that much on the tree, just just a, a small, narrow bit, an inch or two. Uh, there's enough mycelium to allow it to continue to grow. So it does continue to grow. There are some other individuals out there that uh, the belief is that you should only harvest like on those big ones that I showed you, only take like a, a grapefruit size off that and allow it. What will happen is, is that dark protective exterior that it develops on its own actually fills in those other parts in there and will turn all that, that dark color as well. So what we normally do is we have like a specially kind of a, you could use a, a hatchet even and go around the outside of the edge of it along that edge and then put it in and then it'll pry it and it'll pop it off. And that mm -hmm. uh, is one of the easiest ways. Uh, like, and I have a, a big buoy knife that I use as well. So we'll take that and we'll tap it all the way around with a, a hatchet and then we'll put that in and we'll pry it and it'll pop off. Wow. We've, yeah. And sawing it is fine, but the one thing you don't want to do is like use a chainsaw or anything like that because okay. the oil and the bar and all that will contaminate it and, and it won't be any good for you to use. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. No, I just I just use a silky saw or like yep. you know just a, a hand saw type of thing to to do it. Yep. I but there again I wasn't sure. Now when you when you held up them big pieces, it yep. looked like uh, it looked like there was like little white veiny things in there. Uh, well, the white veiny things would that like be... the mycelium. No, no, oh. no. There that you mean these here? Uh, no, on the bottom, on the bottom part. Uh, I don't see any mycelium on there, but yeah, it's okay. it's kind of a lighter color. Yeah. So, and it, was, it, it could be, but this this would be dried up mycelium here. Okay. So that would be the some of the parts of it, but most of it would still be left on the tree. A lot of it. Now this would be some here as well, and along through here, and it okay. it feeds itself all the way through the through the uh, through the chog itself as well. 
Amazing. That's that's yeah. a, that that's a, those are amazing chunks. Those are the same ones that you had at the show, were you? Were they not? Yes. I okay. Think so, yeah. yeah. So those are your show and tell pieces, eh? Because they're monsters. Yeah. Interesting. Oh yeah. Interesting. So but, some of those uh, things. Okay. So what when you do when you do collect your your chaga like that, let let's get in, into the whole processing thing. Um, right. You had a, a couple of interesting points that you pointed out at the show there again about cleaning the chaga and stuff like that. So you pulled it off a tree. What do you do next? So I'll use this one here. So the best thing to do is, as I mentioned to people, is to chunk it up because it's really hard. It goes rock hard. And the person who introduced it to me was using a commercial grade rock crusher to process his. But if you chunk it up quick enough, and then what I do is um, I will use a polypore brush. Don't use a, a wire brush because the wire bristles will actually come off in it and you will get wire bristles found throughout it, which makes it a little bit difficult. So, mm -hmm. and you can see all these pieces here, we'll actually have some machinery that will actually take all this off when I process it. So we eliminate all these impurities in it, all these ones here, so that, because it'll taint your flavor. So when you're consuming it, a lot of people say, oh, that's a really bitter stuff. And I say, oh, try this. So that's that's not what I remember at all. I remember it was really bitter. Well, it could be one of three things. One, they're not taking all the impurities off. And the earlier you take these impurities off when you're harvesting it, the easier it is. And you can just use a knife and kind of shave it off, sort of, is one of the ways to do it. And use a polypore, a, a, a plastic brush, like a cleaning brush, to brush it all off. And you'll clean it out. Like, let's face it, uh, Dennis. That's sitting on a tree like that. Uh, what do you think squirrels and uh, birds are doing out in the bush? They're sitting <laughs> on top of that, uh, yeah. right, and uh, eating their food, et cetera, et cetera. So it taints the flavor a lot. And I use an, a poly, uh, like a poly brush. You pick them up at the dollar store for a couple of bucks and brush it completely clean. And yeah. it'll eliminate all those impurities in there as well. Can you should like you should you wet it to do that? Like, no, no, don't wet it. Uh, um, if you wet it, it um, see the one thing about it is when you're harvesting it, you don't want to use like a plastic bag to, to keep it in simply because it needs to breathe. Right. And a plastic bag will retain the moisture, and you'll get secondary mold growth on it, which can be toxic to you. So you want to use a canvas bag when you're hauling it or taking it out because they will breathe, and then let it air out as soon as possible, especially. If you're harvesting it, uh, some of the times that you mentioned in the winter time, the moisture content is quite a bit lower, and so the likelihood of secondary grow, mold growth and that developing on it is very minimal. And it could be one of the reasons that a lot of individuals say, "Oh, you should only harvest in the winter time." Although, as I mentioned, we met with a lot of shaman and medicine individuals from First Nations, who and every one of them told us that they harvest all year long. So that would be one of the things is is to take it off and then brush it clean and then let it air dry, and you've got a nice piece that can be put in the freezer for later dates if you want as well. Right. So basically not nothing moist to, to clean off, like if you're trying to no. clean off some, you know, bird droppings or or whatever it might be, right? Okay. Yeah, once it dries, it, once it dries, that stuff brushes off pretty easily. Okay. And we send ours in regularly to get tested, and every batch that I've sent in has is, is been completely contaminant-free, not zero percent. Not a, it's not a 99.9, it's a hundred percent contaminant free. Right. Because Swifty Paddler here is also asking, are there any other foreign uh, objects? Like do insects lay eggs into chaga yes, or yeah. anything like that? Yeah. So when, when you're harvesting it, so what I do, or when you're processing it, um, yeah, if you want to see these lines here, yeah. so you'll get insects that will go inside that. So when I process mine, I will open it up here and then right along, you can see this groove right here along this groove here. And you will use that brush, which will clean it out. Now, actually, and I don't have anything with me now, and every piece that I use, I actually use, now you can see I can, some of that stuff coming out of there yep. is dirt of some kind. And a lot of there's some spider web there. So spiders and all sorts of thefts, sorts of things will infest that. But when you clean it, you eliminate a lot of those. 
And to be perfectly honest, what I use with every single piece, even those walnut size pieces, yeah, I use a, um, um, you know, when the, your lobster pick when you're cleaning a lobster out. Oh yeah, yeah. Got that little pick. That's what I use in order to clean it. And we clean them every single little bit. It takes a long time. It's actually labor intense, and you lose a fair bit of it. But you want to make sure you, you got some good quality material. Oh, sure. You, you still there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, I had you on full screen because we're doing show and tell. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There we go. Um, that that's Maybe. awesome. So, are there are there any other like animals out there that that eat chaga or? Well, you know, like are are we the only ones that are basically consuming this stuff? Um, you know no, not really. Actually, we were out with um, my dog and that lab that was hanging around me. Um, and he actually come up and uh, I said, go find the chaga. And he went over to a tree. It was an ironwood that had a chaga on it. And he started eating it right off the tree. No kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So have you got me okay? Yeah, 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 yeah. I see you fine. Are you having uh, issues on your end? Yeah, let me see. Okay, I'm back. There we go. Okay, yeah, yeah. no, I got you fine here. I think everybody uh, sees you quite well. So we get a lot of insects, and actually I need a, an entomologist because there is a green wing beetle that I find that uh, it's quite often in a lot of the chagas wherever we harvest, and a lot of it will drive 10 hours north of our Oshawa to harvest a lot of ours up near Chapleau and areas like that. Mm -hmm. um, but we've also found it in other areas in Thunder Bay and in the Bancroft area, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, but uh, th this green wing beetle, uh, very small, actually seems to show up a lot in a lot of it uh, when we're cleaning them. Yeah. Here, here's a, Mr. Walsmeister is asking, can someone have too much chaga? Can you OD on it? And you, you just mentioned that you basically just pass it through your system, right? Well, no, no, you have to watch. According to Health Canada, you shouldn't consume more than the uh, total extraction of 3.6 grams of chaga a day, which is about a heaping tablespoon. Okay. And so you can get, imagine how much tea you could get out of that though. Yeah. So it would be considerable amount. And there was all the studies that I've ever seen, there's only been one, I believe it was a Japanese, 72-year-old Japanese woman that had her kidneys shut down because she consumed too much. But that's the only case out of all the reports that I've ever re read or seen of any of it. And it's all the, the ones still mention that that one individual. So, But according to Health Canada, it's a not consumed more than uh, 3.6 grams in a, on a daily basis. Huh. There you go. And but it would be hard to consume that unless you're actually eating the stuff, which we'll we'll get into consumption in a moment here. Sure. Um, because there are many different ways you can actually consume chaga yeah. uh, for for different benefits. Uh, most popular way for what consuming for, it for consuming. Yeah. A lot of people will take it in a powder form and put it in their smoothies. Oh, okay. So they tell me. Yeah. Or I have other individuals that bake with it, cook with it. I know there was one. There was one restaurant in Alliston that actually had, uh, they they made what they called chaga bites. They were about the size of a Timbit to give people a, an approximate size. And they had chocolate and chaga powder in it and that sort of way. So a lot of people will bake with it as well or put it on their soups and stews and salads and things like that as well. Okay. Yeah. So is that, is that a good use for it after, like, say, for instance, you've, I've used my, my marble size chunks and, you know, they, they've been boiled till there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And then, um, the, you know, I, I'm, I'm left with that chunk. Can yeah. Dry that. And then, and then grind well, it and there, there's a couple of ways to do extractions from the chaga itself. One is the water extraction. So, and there's two forms of water extraction. There's a cold water extraction yeah. and a warm water extraction. So what I usually tell, I mentioned about the crock pot, and what I tell people is let those chunks soak in overnight without turning it on. And then turn it on for 8 to 12 hours on low. Don't let it boil. And there's one study that came out uh, that I show people. It was in Vitality magazine in uh, February 1st, 2018, that talks about the te temperature extraction. But I'm reading articles out of South Korea now where they're extracting at boiling points. So it's hard to determine the exact, find the science that shows 
exactly what the proper one is. So I tell people to let it simmer on low for 8 to 12 hours, not boil in the crock pot. So do a cold water extraction first, then a warm water extraction. Now, what you can do with yours, Dennis, afterwards is you can make your own tincture. So what you do is you take a jar, basically, and fill it up with about three quarters full of the chaga and then put alcohol in it. And most of the time in Ontario, people would use a vodka and then they let it sit for two to three months in uh, in the like in a closet or a cupboard and then just shake it or stir it up two, three times a week. Mm -hmm. And that'll extract a fat soluble antioxidant, whereas the water extracts water soluble antioxidants. So that's one of the biggest benefits to this. It's the highest antioxidant producing material of anything. So depending on what extraction type you do, 100 grams of chaga, for example, 100 grams of blueberries produce about 2,450 units of antioxidants, where chaga, 100 grams of chaga, can produce 385,000 units of antioxidants. Wow. And everybody, everybody hears about antioxidants, but a lot of people really don't know, okay, what do antioxidants actually do? Yeah, what do, they, they, what do they do? Yeah. So... <laughs> And I hand out uh, studies to that as well. And essentially, uh, to put it in a uh, easily understandable terms, is when we do anything, when I'm talking, I move my hands, we're burning energy. A lot of the times, you don't burn that complete molecule. Those unburnt molecules are called parts of molecules are called free radicals. And you can get free radicals from secondhand smoke, from what we breathe in, the toxins in the air, some of the foods that we eat in. And these free radicals have a tendency to congregate or concentrate with other free radicals. And then so a lot of times they will locate in organs and start to break down your organs because the molecules there will start to bond with other ones or try to. And that starts to break down your systems. Essentially, antioxidants consume free radicals. The higher the antioxidants, the more anti antioxidants, the more free radicals they consume, the less your systems break down in the first place. That's the easiest way to explain it. Mm hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so a lot of research just into that alone, right? Well, yeah, it, it really what it is is the, the the antioxidants bond with the molecules from the free radicals that make them and, and then eliminate them that way. So that's there's a lot of research in that, yeah. So just so I got this right, so after you've done your boil or your, your water extraction and you could take yep. that, that particular trunk, do you have to dry it out first and then do the alcohol extraction? Most of the time I suggest that, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So I, I, all this time I've been wasting it, but I've been wanting to make a, a, a tincture. tincture too, but I, I was going to use just fresh chaga. Yeah. Yeah. You can do that as well. But then after you use a fresh chaga, then use it in a, a water extraction method as well. And that's why they talk about a triple extraction method. Yeah. Because that way you can extract the maximum number of antioxidants from the uh, the chaga with a triple extraction. That's stuff. It's amazing. It's it, it is amazing stuff. I've always heard that, and uh, you know, I I don't know per like I consume it, but I don't know personally what effect it's having on me because I don't know. I, I I've never had the cancers or high blood pressure or arthritis and stuff like that. That's and maybe that that could be a reason why. Maybe it's helping with that, right? So, well, with the antioxidant level in there, there was actually um, a couple of um, studies that referenced. There was a lot of athletes, uh, particularly in Asia, a lot of the, ch the Chinese athletes were consuming large quantities of the chaga before they were training because it allowed them to train about 10% longer. So because it wasn't allowing their systems to break down as quick. So they were wondering why they were able to set new records, and it was mostly consumption of, of chaga was one of them. Cordyceps is another uh, mushroom that they utilize for energy. But yeah. So hmm. it helps in a lot of ways. Yeah. Now, I, I just seen a really interesting, I'm going to put it up on screen here. Rod, Rod is saying you can buy it on Amazon right from Ontario. Yeah. Now, I, I remember part of your presentation is kind of like buyer beware. You kind of have to, it's like, is it, is it a lot like going to, uh, you know, say Cuba and you're buying banana leaf cigars, you know what I yeah. mean, instead of the Cohibas? Yes. Right? So, it, yeah, you have to watch because... Yeah, they do sell it on Amazon. One, you don't know. Um, I actually, one of the slides that I did in my presentation, although I didn't put it in, in this year, this year's presentation at the show, was a picture, and it said uh, Chaga, and on the actual picture on the, the bottle they were selling was actually a artist Kong. It wasn't even a Chaga. 
And not only that, but uh, and the same thing with the Vitality magazine. When they uh, actually did the article, they included a picture. And the picture they included was of a burl. And I contacted the publisher and I said, hey, uh, you got a bit of a problem here because that's a burl. She said, well, we weren't sure. But if you could send us a picture, we'd really appreciate it. So I sent them yeah. a picture for them to use. But, yeah. So, yeah, you can get it at other locations. And another thing is that um, I had one friend of mine. Uh, John, no. John had a knee operation that went bad, and he was, they put him on morphine tablets, and he was still in a lot of pain. So when I said, John, I said, John, try this. So I gave him some chaga. That was on a Friday. I called him up on the Sunday, and um, John's, a, he's a Scotchman, and uh, I have a bit of Scotch in the background, so I can do a wee bit of that, you know. Anyways, I called him up. I said, John, he says, uh, how's your knee? He says, Jenny, he says, I don't know what's going on, but I got to tell you, he says, I'm not taking any of the morphine pills now, and I got no pain in my knee at all, and all I do is have three cups of tea a day. And so John's daughter uh, married a guy who has one of these monster trucks, and the monster truck show where they do their sales for the entire year is in a show in Vegas every year. So they went to Vegas, and John forgot to take his chaga with him. So I come back and I said, oh, I was a trip on on on. He said, oh, it was great. He said, but he said, I bought some chaga down there. He said, it didn't work. He said, I don't know what happened. I said, well, can I take a look at it? So he shows me the bottle. And yeah, it was the right picture on it. And I said, well, here's your problem here. I said, they were, they were growing the chaga on, um, in wheat stock or potato starch. And the difficulty with that is that is you can't extract the beneficial components out of the birch bark if it's not there in the first place. So you're not getting the same benefits. Yeah, it can be uh, potentially artificially grown in some areas, but you're not going to get the same benefit out of it all. And as soon as he went back and uh, got back here and started on the on the regular chaga that we provided for him, pain was gone again. Mm -hmm. So you got to watch what you're getting. Buyer beware. Yeah, buy buy from a reputable source. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that stands to reason. Um, Gord Heath, uh, he's on fire tonight. You're on fire tonight, Gord. <laughs> if uh, making a tincture, should you only use the heart of the chunk? Uh, would you recommend using vodka alcohol or other solvent? Can you use a different type of alcohol? Um, well, there is one. I, I spoke to a lot of naturopathic doctors about that, and they were getting – you can get ethanol from the liquor store, but you have to get a permit to get it. And they said it was not, not a problem. They were making their own – tinctures that way but uh um yes uh vodka is what most people are using and yes you can use the complete chaga itself the whole parts of it just break it into small pieces if you're gonna if you want to make a tincture you want your pieces smaller so basically if you can get them down so the ones that you've been showing us there dennis if you took those and dried them and put them in a coffee grinder you can get them down to about a peppercorn size once you put that in, the smaller the pieces are, the easier it is to extract extract it. But you, you got to watch because it, once it's dried, if you put too much in your coffee grinder, you're going to burn out your coffee grinder. Right. So, yes, you use uh, – this question was about the heart of it. You can use all the components of it. And, yeah, there's perfect size material for making a tincture with. Now, what you can do with that is if you only have about three-quarters of that volume in that jar, um, right. yep, you fill it up with alcohol. And um, yeah, that about, and then fill it all the way up to the top with uh, vodka, and let yeah. it sit for two, three months, and it'll do an extraction for you that way. And then, and then, can you top it up again? Because that's not really going to get you that much of a tincture, will it? Well, it, um, no, I I've only done. I know individuals have only used it done a single extraction with it. Yep. And so that way they get, and they only take probably about ten drops a day of the extraction from that. Very, very concentrated, high concentration of chaga in there. Okay, so you're saying that that particular jar. Now, a viewer had sent me this uh, quite a while back, and I haven't really used it because, like I say, we make most of our chaga on in a, in a coffee pot or like yep. an old camp kettle, right, yep. on the stove. Right. And and uh, this here, you you make it this, this, with the small chunks of the, like uh, a tea bag or something, and before you know yep. it, you're just it's like drinking cowboy coffee you're spitting chunks of chago <laughs> while you're drinking right so yeah 
Yeah, and if I want my wife to enjoy it, it's got to be done with the chunks. So she's not she's not doing that because if she it, it took a little bit to get her to start drinking it, but now now she drinks it all the time as well. So well, what you can do is you can get your own tea bags, mm -hmm. and if you check around some of the tea stores, they'll sell you bags. They're ex pretty expensive to buy, uh, but then then you can load them in the tea bag yourself, tie it tight, and you're not going to get any of that what you're referring to. Right. So when, when we do our product, we, we try to find different ways to make it as easy as possible for people to incorporate in their daily routine. And the tea bags are the easiest because everybody knows how to do tea bags. I get a lot of people buying the chunks and probably watching this. They'd say, oh, I got to get me some of those chunks. And then three months, two months later, they, they always come back. Say, I got those chunks, but I forgot how to use them. What do I do with them? Or those chunks have been sitting there for the longest time. But in a tea bag like that, it's easy to use, and they know how to use it real quick, and it's really simple. Cool. Well, you know what? It's uh, it's at eight. Well, it's after eight o'clock actually. I'm just going to acknowledge a couple of my uh, my sponsors here, and then when I get back, or when we get back, I'm going to uh, post a link in the description or in the chat over here. And if anybody wants to come up and ask Jerry a question, because I know you guys, uh, especially Gore, has been having some great questions. Uh, you know what? I'm actually going to put the invite up there right now. Are you cool with taking some questions from viewers, uh, Jerry? Not a problem at all. Sure. Awesome. awesome. Okay. There we go. So there's a StreamYard link. Uh, if you do pop on the screen, please do just make sure you shut off your YouTube volume. Don't be shy. It's very simple. All you do is hit the link, set up your camera and your, uh, your microphone, and I'll see you pop into the basement, and I'll bring you up on screen. So uh, we'll get that. Uh, Jerry, if you have to uh, get yourself a new beverage or get rid of a beverage, now's the time to do it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. And just want to acknowledge a couple of my uh, sponsors here. There's nothing like being out there. For over 50 years, we've been connecting people with nature by building classic Canadian canoe designs using the best materials available. We built a reputation on durable, dependable canoes, allowing you to focus on what's important, whether that's unplugging in remote wilderness spending quality time with your favorite people or nailing the perfect line visit novacraft.com to find the perfect canoe for you and locate your nearest authorized dealer All right. Yeah. Welcome back, guys and gals. Uh, just waiting for Jerry to get back into his seat there. Hope everybody's enjoying the show that we're having on Chaga. Uh, you know what? Truly a miracle mushroom from what they say. Uh, and if anybody out there hasn't actually tried Chaga, you really should. Um, just to let you know what it tastes like. To me, I find it has uh, notes of vanilla. It has vanilla notes to it um, and depends how strong you brew it, right? Uh, if you're making it into a tea is uh, going to determine like, you know, how much flavor you're going to get out of it type of thing. So, but as Jerry had mentioned earlier too, there's many different ways that you can actually uh, do it. Uh, some people use it as a coffee substitute. So you can, you know, you, you brew your, uh, or you make your, your pot of uh, chaga tea, you put it into your cup and you know what, you can add your sugar and milk to taste. Uh, I've even added uh, Irish cream to it. I use it a lot of times and I'll put it into uh, my oatmeal in the morning. So instead of ra rather than using just hot water, I'll use chocolate water. So uh, yeah, Jerry's back here. Let's get him back on screen. Welcome back, sir. Glad to be back. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for... Uh, Taking that time there. Nobody's popped on the screen yet. Uh, if anybody, like I say, wants to come up and ask Jerry a question, otherwise we're just going to keep going here, man. We're going to keep going. Sure. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just looking here, getting my comments back up. Where are they? Where my comments go? Here's my comments. Okay. Uh, let's see here. I did. I, I have been going through the chat here and uh, starring a couple questions uh, to, to use throughout. Uh, let's see here. This one here caught my eye earlier for Kevin French. Uh, once you don't have any flavor coming out of the tea soak, uh, the chunks and alcohol with an, uh, withdraw even more properties. So 
Yes. Do you, when you're doing it that way, do you just basically do it until you have no color left, or yes. you can take it you mean, beforehand? Out of the out of the tea or out of the uh, alcohol extraction? Uh, well, let's see. Out of the from the tea soak. So he's taking it from the tea soak. Right. And then he's soaking the chunks in alcohol. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. You just want to. The larger the pieces are, the the longer they have to be exposed to water to, or alcohol to extract the benefit. So the smaller the pieces are, the better it is, and the least of the the least amount of time is required, lesser amount of time is required in order to get the benefits out of it. Okay. Now you yourself, you, you've been, uh, you've been experimenting with things, uh, with Chaga. Um, yeah. you know, you, you, you sell Chaga. Now I, I recall you saying that, yeah, you sell Chaga, but you don't really push the sales. You like the education and the helpfulness part of it and everything else, but you yeah. are a resource to be able to get the Chaga, right? Yeah. yeah. But you're working on different things, uh, different ways of presenting. Uh, share, share with us some of these things that you you kind of invented with chaga. Well, you mean the chaga maple? Oh, man, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it took me about five years to invent that. And right. it, um, what we found, like the average maple syrup producer, from the time they put the sap into an evaporator, and I went around and asked a bunch of them, it takes them about two hours from the time that goes in to when they can start bottling. It takes me two and a half days to make that size there uh, was uh, 40 odd bottles, two and a half days, 24 hours a day in order to make sure that the beneficial aspects are in there. And it was an entire process that I developed that uh, now you have something that has all the benefits directly inside that. And it has a very unique flavor, I believe. Is it not Dennis? Yeah. Yeah. You know what? It's uh you, I, I've, I've done it just on a teaspoon. Yep. Yeah, that's how you recommend it. But uh, I, I use it. I, I usually use. Uh, I don't use white sugar. I, I use uh, sugar in the raw. Yeah. And um, since I, I got that there, and it goes a long way because I, I don't take a lot of sugar in my coffees or teas. Yep. I'm just like I'm a half a teaspoon guy. Yeah. And that there, because it is so sweet, I even use probably less. But I just I put it in my chaga and. Yep. It, uh, it adds that maple flavor to it, you know, or you can add honey to it or whatever. But that mm -hmm. is that is really nice. I, I should have bought a couple of bottles of that when I see it. So. The, um, a lot of people, everybody has a different perspective of the flavor. A lot of people have, um, oh, I taste like a molasses. Or I have other individuals who contact us. And I remember one saying, oh, I, strawberry, raspberry, a, a raspberry chocolate, a vanilla. Uh, a lot of chocolates come out. Everybody has a different perspective of the taste. But rather unique and and but still has all the medicinal applications directly in a beneficial beneficial way so it took us quite a while uh, about five years in order to get all that down down pat and when it's running we try to make what we can but we don't have that listed on our site but when i do events like the sportsman show or or i do a lot of farmers markets or other events or hand of man in peterborough and a bunch of other things and, and home shows and stuff like that that we have it available there mm -hmm. well that's one of the things and one of the other things I, I um, developed was a, uh, what happened was I was dealing with uh, Dr. Couture, who I mentioned earlier, and he actually asked me if I could make him a topical application with him. Well, it took me a year and a half to get a formula that was working, and then it took me four to six months to get the manufacturing process right with the topical application now. And now we have, um, it's all food-grade organic material used in the product. And um, we have huge success with uh, eczema, uh, psoriasis, rashes, bug bites, burns, acne. I have one person come in. They said, oh, their uh, radiation burns from their radiation therapy. They put it on that, and it was the only thing that worked. Lately, we've had a lot of individuals actually come forward and saying that uh, they developed shingles, in my own mother being one of them. I had one friend of mine down Prince Edward County, Gary, Gary had shingles for uh, a year, and he said, I've used everything and nothing worked at all. I said, oh, I'll send you something, Gary. I knew him for a long time, since the 90s. So I sent him some. He got back, touched him. He said, Jerry, he said, that's the only thing that works for me. I can't believe it. He said, as soon as they start to come out, break out, I put it on right away, cleans up within minutes, and I'm all cleaned up right away. Works fantastic. Wow. See, there's a lot of antiviral, antibacterial, and antifungal material in Chagas itself. So, and there's a lot of studies that show a lot of those things. So it has a lot of different benefits that will work in a topical application as well. And as I mentioned, um, we're trying to, uh, we've got chaga growing in Petri dishes, 
but I don't have a growth median yet that I can take. I've got the mycelium growing off, off the chagas, but I don't have a growth median that I can use that will take from the Petri dish to inoculate the tree just quite yet. We're pretty close. Wow, won't that be amazing if you could accomplish that, right? Yeah, yeah, we've tried a number of different ways. Yeah, got a got a viewer here in the in the basement. Just going to bring him up on screen for a question. Sure. Yeah, here we got Ingo Hetzer. How are you doing, Ingo? Not bad, not bad. You guys can hear me okay? Sound great. Feel loud and clear, man. Loud and clear. I, I'm I'm the shy guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're. I I highly doubt that. This is uh, Ingo Hetzer from uh, Kid Products. Uh, how you doing tonight, buddy? Good to see you. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my question to uh, Jerry, allergy, you know, yeah. there's lots of allergies out there. Um, birch tree allergy, that kind of yep. stuff. Have there yep. been any studies done on that? Yeah. Um, the thing to watch is that, uh, and that's one of the things. So um, all our stuff, just so you know, it, it just says to watch for birch and a mushroom allergy. Now my son, um, we were doing a Wellington farmer's market and the lady beside us, uh, beside where we were in Wellington, she has a birch allergy so bad that she carries an EpiPen with her. And she, um, and I said, look, I'm not a doctor, can't give medical advice. And my suggestion is you shouldn't take the chance. Well, she decided to try it and she didn't have a reaction to it at all. And I have another individual that um, uh, has uh, mushroom allergies as well. And um, uh, Lawrence is his name. And uh, another one in one of the clinics I supply. Um, and the same thing with them. So Lawrence, I said, well, Lawrence, if you've got a mushroom allergy, you know, you shouldn't be trying this. He said, no, well, I, I, I don't have a bad reaction, but I, I know within a couple of minutes, well, there he will. Now, Lawrence uses it all the time with no problem at all. However, the lady at one of the clinics that I supply, she has a mushroom allergy as well. And she was using the, the, the cream on uh, some rashes on her body. And for the first two days, she didn't have anything. But after that, she said, I started to think, get the sense that I was having a reaction to it. So she stopped using it. So anytime people have a birch or a mushroom allergy, I advise them to, to stay clear unless they know for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my, my brother's got back problems, uh, you know, pain, that kind of stuff. And I always say, you know, try the chaga, try the chaga. I'll stand right beside you and stab you with a with an EpiPen, but he hasn't, he hasn't done that yet. <laughs> You so probably stab with the EpiPen even if he didn't have a reaction. So, <laughs> does, he have, yeah. does he have a birch or a mushroom allergy? Birch. Birch. Birch so, tree allergy, yeah. So, and it's only birch trees, right? Uh, um, and nuts. Birch and tree and well? nut allergy, yeah. So I'm wondering, see, those individuals that have the birch allergy like that, what would happen if they harvested, harvested off ironwood or a hop hornbeam? Um, yeah. would, would they have a reaction then? That's a, something that I can't tell you because I've had met a number of individuals that have birch allergies, but I have not met anybody that's had a, an ironwood or a hop hornbeam um, allergy yet. So if you harvested the chaga off that, might it be able to benefit him without having an allergic reaction, which would yeah. be something that you're best to decide. As I mentioned before, I'm not a doctor, don't go, don't, can't give medical advice and don't. But it might be yeah. something that might be beneficial to your brother. Yeah, we uh, we're gonna feed him some and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I'll send the study into you. So okay, yeah. Any of those testimonies that we hear about, we just add to it because that's what happens. Is I, I usually hear of these cases and then I pass them on um, effectively to let people know how people have reacted. Some yeah. not some because apparently you can be allergic to different mushrooms, and I have an allergic uh, reaction to some bee stings but not all bee stings so when i get uh paper wasps i'm uh i have to watch out but if it's a yellow jacket or if it's a bumblebee uh, i have not had any reaction to them at all hmm. interesting yeah didn't know that yeah. yeah well thank you very much okay thanks for anything else questions. Ingo? no more questions mm, no hey hopefully I, we'll see I, you I, next week on the I, 100th I, anniversary I, show yeah i i bought some tea from from uh, from your from the sportsman show and i've been drinking it you know cup of tea at night or so and uh yeah very good i'm running i'm running out so hopefully are you at the outdoor adventure show at all or no no i wasn't uh i've not i'm not uh no i did not do that one at all okay. i'm not even sure when that one is but uh we try because the, all the shows have been stopped and i was doing about 30 shows a year so it, it's difficult to to spread ourselves that thin to try and get out not only that but to make sure 
I only harvest enough based on the previous year's uh, sales that we have and about a 10% increase because I don't want to over harvest. Yeah. Um, so we, we limit the number of shows that we do. And I've got about six stores now wanting to carry our product that I just say, look, I worry, but not right now. I don't have enough product to be able to supply you. So good. Well, thank you very much. Well, well thanks for asking thanks the question. For tonight, Ingo. Yeah, I'll talk to you. Cheers. Okay. And we uh, we will jump right next to or to our next person here. We have uh, Darren from Ride Paddle Repeat here. How you doing there, Darren? Oh, hey, good. How are you guys? Good, good. good. You got a question for Jerry? Yeah, very interesting topic. And I, uh, you know, I did join late, so apologies if this was covered somewhat already. But I did hear you discuss a little bit about the uh, relationship to the First Nations when you were, you know, looking into the research. Is there any yes. like other information or? Um, history that you found with the First Nations of uses for chaga that they might have used, like for any ritual purposes, for example, like rites or. Um, oh, the only one you know, that I did. Celebration. From, so, First Nations have been using it for thousands of years. The Algonquins call it buck buck. In each of the various communities, uh, whether it's the the Cree or the Iroquois or whoever, um, they all have different names for it, um, and they use it as a medicine. So for a lot, the only one that I didn't mention and have not used it was I met one First Nation individual who would make a smudge out of it. And what they would essentially do is they would take some coals and they would light the chaga on fire. And every time he got um, a migraine headache, he would make a smudge, and inhale the smudge, and it would clear up his migraines, according to him. But that's the only other situation or individual that I've met that uses chaga for something other than what we have been promoting or talking about during the entire show. And one of the other things was Dennis held up the Chaga Maple. I was doing a show down in uh, Quinty, down in Belleville, and um, I had a, um, and I supply a, a number of First Nation communities with Chaga for their, for their communities. And um, I had a call from down Quinty way in, in the, medicine person called me up and said, look, we just had six more individuals uh, diagnosed with cancer. Uh, we need some of the, your chaga maple. And I said, I'm sorry, but I don't have any. I'm, I'm all sold out. They were not very happy. They got rather upset with me. When you make medicine like that, you have to make enough for the entire year. I said, I, I, I can't tell you how long it's going to last. And I only have limited abilities on how much I can make and how much I can process. Uh, in the first place. So when it goes, it's gone. I'm sorry about that. But so there are a number of uses that uh, a lot of First Nation communities use. And I'm dealing with one right now in Saskatchewan, who's uh, taking a lot of the chaga um, to a lot of the powwows uh, circuit in Saskatchewan and Manitoba that they're doing. So they use it for quite a regular basis. That's really interesting. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, and the smudge idea, that's interesting. Is that something we could replicate at all or probably not recommended? Uh, well, it would be. Uh, basically, all they do is they take a piece of chaga, like the one Dennis showed you, the one that, that I had here, and uh, they would uh, light part of it on fire, use coals to it, and the smoke from it is what they use, and then they inhale the smoke is how they get their, uh, their uh, smudge. And that's all they were using. But I've never promoted it. Uh, the only reason I even mentioned it is because you asked the question of some of the other uh, resources that, uh, or ways that people in our First Nation community use, utilize it. And it was only one individual that had mentioned that to me uh, previously. Hmm. I, I've heard yeah, I appreciate that. It could be used for other purposes like that, too, as fire carriers. Um, for those that care not to consume it, I guess. Uh, yeah. Dave, I, I even know an individual who actually made fire starters out of chaga. Yeah, and that's one of the things as well. Um, when you're done with all your chunks, Dennis, you can use that as a fire starter. See, um, it's very well known for Dave. I don't know if you call. He was, um, what was his book? Uh, How to Start a Fire with Water um, at the Sportsman Show. And, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Dave, yeah. Yeah. yeah um, he actually started one on the Friday one piece about the size of a small apple. And he used that, the coals, all weekend long for three days. It kept in the coal way and because you can transport that to keep your fire going. And that was one of the things that a lot of First Nations uh, believed <clears throat> to use it for as well, was transporting fires. 
<coughs> Excuse me. Gee, I hope I'm not That's giving you COVID being yeah. close. You know, I don't think we're six <laughs> feet apart. <so. laughs> it's okay. I tested positive in January. <laughs> Kelly, Darren, we're going to get you coughing pretty soon, too. Yeah. I'm sorry, what did you say? I said we're going to get you yeah, coughing here kidding. pretty soon, too. It was a joke because I just coughed. Never mind. Oh, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> right ahead, man. Brutal. Sorry, man. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you consume chaga yourself, Darren? Uh, no, I actually haven't. I've been really interested to actually be able to try and harvest some. But now that I see the website, too, I think I'm definitely going to pull some off uh, there and Maybe uh maybe I can borrow some of yours there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I I I often share a lot of times I uh Ingo, for instance, that was just on screen, uh, him and I canoe together. And uh actually this piece come from the trip that was one of the pieces that I had uh, harvested on that trip. And I there were a couple other pieces that I give to the other guys. Like, you know, like I say, if I as long as I got enough for myself, I'm happy. I don't mind sharing it myself because like Jerry says, it's uh it's got such a, you know, su such a high rapport that, you know, it's, it's nice to share, share yeah. the health, share the wealth, share the health. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a really great stream. So I appreciate the information. I'm definitely, uh, I'm definitely in. I'll try some. Great, man. Thanks, great. Any other questions there? Uh, that's all for me. Much appreciated. All right, buddy, we'll talk later. Thanks very much for popping on. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, I, I noticed somewhere, let me hear, I'm just going to back up here. Uh, Alan Bierhoff was saying that uh, he just tried to order some from you, Jerry, and said that he couldn't deliver it to his address in North Carolina. Is there any reason for that? Or Okay. So um, what happened was I changed insurance companies and the insurance company I have now did not want me to send to the States. So uh, that was the only reason for insurance purposes. Um, to comply with the, what the, uh, the, the insurance company um, wanted us to do. But uh, if he uh, contacts me uh, by email, I can, uh, we can have a discussion about some of the other options. If he knows somebody up this way that is willing to send it to him, that's what, because uh, I've shipped around the world. I've shipped to uh, Australia, South Africa, all through the States, uh, through Europe. Um, I have a people in Bermuda that pick it up on a regular basis. But in order to comply, what happens is she has a brother in Peterborough and she buys an entire year supply out of Peterborough. And then her brother uh, gets it down to her out of Peterborough. So uh, I, I got to comply with what the uh, insurance company wants us to do, but that's the reason why. Otherwise we'd be, we'd be happy to. Gee, Once hey, maybe, uh, maybe Alan, Maybe we should talk because I, I, maybe Jerry could send it to me and I could uh, forward it <laughs> on to you. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that where there's a will, there's a way, right? So yeah, yeah. But no, just, you got to comply. So that's that's uh, that's the the right thing. Yeah. To do. yeah. If he yeah, if he sends me uh, an email, we can uh, discuss some of the other options as you just mentioned about uh, uh, knowing somebody up this way that has the potential to send it to him. Cool. Cool. Um, I know, well, Rhonda Barnett, uh, who's watching on Facebook right now, hopefully right. you're still on Facebook there, Rhonda. Uh, you put a question up there, and I know we covered this before, but I, I'm sure for anybody that may have come in late, it, it might be a good idea just to cover it again, because as you mentioned, you're yeah. not a doctor. Yeah, um, not so a doctor, like, can't get medical advice. What yeah, I do no. do is pass on information. Right, so, right. Is, so Ron is asking if it interferes with any medications like blood pressure meds. Um, yes, you have to watch because it uh, can lower blood pressures too low if you're on medications. And so um, and there was uh, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. If you do an online search of the best cancer centers in the world, it's always listed as one of the top five in the world. And it uh, talks about some of the interactions to watch out with. And blood pressure is one of them because it can lower it too low. So it depends on... Uh, normally, I would tell people, and it depends, because a lot of people will take like low-dose aspirin uh, for their blood pressure and things like that as well. But we have a lot of good success with individuals. I have one lady up um, Little Britain, just south of Lindsay Way, that uh, she dropped hers 20 points in two weeks, according to her. And I got a lot of other individuals very successfully do that as well. But when you're taking medication, you should watch and you should make sure that um, you check with your doctor that there's any interaction because blood pressure and diabetic medication were the two main ones that I found that should be watched very closely when you're taking chaga. If you walked into a store and spoke to somebody, according to Health Canada, the only cautions were for 
pregnant and breastfeeding females, uh, where our research is a little bit farther. Um, and I gave you the site where you could look it up, being the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, uh, Chaga Mushroom, and it'll give you some of the details in there. There you have it. Um, do you, I, you gave me a whole bunch of stuff at the show, a lot of yep. great, great reading. And that, this is the stuff that you're, you're holding up. Is this available on your website? Um, we or, do have some of it. Yeah. Yeah. Or if people ask questions, would I, because, uh, and some of the things to, to watch for is, is when you are looking at a research article, there's lots of stuff on the net about it, but you got to watch and you got to make, cause there's a lot of rumor and innuendo. So before I even read a research article, I don't know if you can see that or not. Here, let but, me put your full screen there. Okay. Yep. On the bottom here of this article is the references used to write the research paper. You want to look at the reference material used to write a research paper to determine the validity of it. And although I've only got eight references here, I think on this one from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, there's probably at least two more pages of references which is a, a very well-researched article. So you want to make sure that it's not just rumor and innuendo or somebody's opinion, but a well-researched one written by somebody with some authority. Hmm. So in regards to the blood pressure, I advise people to talk to your doctor and watch out uh, because it can lower blood pressures too low when yeah. you're taking the medication. So the, like the research on chaga is still ongoing, right? It's, uh, it's not like... Uh, I. I, I see a million different YouTube videos out there and stuff, yep. you know, people talking of it, but uh, not, none have had the quite the same information that you give because you're actually doing research on this. So like, you yep. know, and, and the, all these, all these uh, remedies that uh, they, they speak of are obviously the type of remedies that pharmaceutical companies don't really want you to know because yes. they're not selling their pharmaceuticals, right? Uh, exactly. this, is a, this is a natural remedy that's been around for thousands of years. And, yep. and chaga is actually pretty rare in North America. Isn't it really big like over Russia? Not like we're going to go there to get anything. Right now, well, but... actually, um, there was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, yep. Alexander, and I can't pronounce his last name, Stol something that uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, because he wrote a book called Cancer Ward. That's the translated name. He was sent to, sentenced to the gulag with terminal cancer. And while he was there, he talked to the locals there that told him to use this chaga to cure his cancer. He ended up curing his cancer, a terminal cancer. Um, and he ended up curing and writing a book about it and won a Nobel Peace Prize about it. So yeah, it's very popular. And actually in Russia, They've been recordedly using it since the 1950s for cancer therapy, but historically it goes back another 400 years or so in Russia. And uh, it's, there's all kind of references to a lot of different areas that have been using it throughout the world as well for hmm. centuries. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's been around a long time. Cool. So in, in your, in your opinion, then which would be the, if, if somebody is using Chaga or, or wants to use Chaga to, help help with with cancer or or any of these things in your opinion what is the best method of consumption to to get the most out of chaga um the 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 three cups a day the longer it steeps the stronger it is um so if you're using the tea bags uh it usually says you know for example in the products that we carry there's lots of other people that supply it and so long as you get it from a reputable source that's that's fine um, the tea bags, for example, it says up to five, six cups on the tea bags. However, with a tea bag, if you want to use it for something that's strong, and I've had cases, I mean, the spring fishing show was one of the first ones where an individual come up to me and he says, that's the stuff right there. He said, five years ago, I didn't know what that was. They gave me three months to live. He had pancreatic cancer. He said, um, and this is him telling me the story. He said, uh, they told me to go home and get my papers in order, and somebody suggested I try this. He said I started on that three cups a day, and all he did was he had uh, three strong cups. So he would take basically a lot of times your chunks or some of the the uh, peppercorn size pieces that you had showed up in the other jar, or let it steep the smaller amounts with the tea bags, and then had three cups. And he said, "Look at me now." He says, five years later, I'm all free and clear still." Hmm. So. It's amazing. So, yeah, three cups a day. And uh, like I said, we're not doctors, can't give medical advice. 
but I do give the testimonials of other individuals who've passed on to this. And I have stories that just, I, I like people come and tell me these stories on a, every time I'm doing a show or something. So I hear one of these stories that just, well, Saturday I was one, the skin cream, uh, the guy, he came in and he said his father-in-law used it on his skin cancer. He said, and um, he put like seven or eight applications on, which probably meant about two weeks. He said, completely cleared it up. Well, wow. you know, we get this, these sort of stories all the time from individuals. So, hmm. but I tell people, and then I give them the research, like I handed you and let, yeah. uh, let them read or people will contact me or I'm dealing with this specific one. Do you have any research on that? And then I try to find out and source them and then I'll send them the actual research study dealing to what they're dealing with, whether Crohn's and colitis or some of the cancers that they talk about or some of the tumors and a bunch of other things as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> this stuff, this stuff is amazing. And it, it, like I say, coming from a birch tree, which is the magical tree to begin with. I, did you ever watch a documentary on, uh, I think it's on Netflix yeah. uh, called Fantastic Magical Mushrooms? Mushrooms? Or fantastic, magical fungi, fantastic fungi. That's the one. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. They, they they cover a lot of uh, of the chaga mushroom as well as the turkey tail mushroom. Um, I've heard combinations of turkey tail and chaga together. Turkey tail. Oh, look at that. Turkey tail. There's some turkey tail right there. Let's show people what that looks like here. Uh, wink right there. Okay. See, this is all the turkey tail here. Yep. Okay, so a turkey tail is pretty popular just about everywhere. You can go in just about any bush you want and you'll find turkey tail. Um, yeah, that's how Paul Stamets' um, show you're talking about. And yeah. Paul's probably the number one mushroom pundit in the world. Very well researched, very well informed. He's done a lot of research, done a lot of good stuff out there. A couple things on the show that I kind of questioned. Uh, he talked about the... Uh, uh, we'll call them the the cybersilin, the psychedelic mushrooms. Yeah, yeah he spent a lot of time on that one. <laughs> well, it had a big impact on his life when he was growing up because he had some very, uh, I believe it was a speech impediment. Um, and when he he did the those those other mushrooms, um, had a significant impact. But he talked about it uh, being responsible for cognitive development in humans. And I don't necessarily know that that's true because there's not a lot of research that verifies that. But most of the stuff was very informative and a, and a good watch as well. Yeah, it's a good show. Um, and he talks about turkey tail. And it was turkey tail, I believe, that his mother used to cure her, uh, her uh, I believe it was breast cancer that she yeah, had. Yeah, she was like stage four terminal yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of different mushrooms. Like uh, here's another one here. Okay, that's a, that's a reishi mushroom. Oh, it looked like that, that looked like something from Tim Hortons there. <laughs> yeah. And, and another, I had some, uh, these people were growing reishi. Um, so they, they, they gave me this one to say it was a reishi mushroom. They were growing up, uh, Gooderham way, I believe they were, but yeah, there's a lot of different wild mushrooms uh, out there that when you're harvesting lion's mane is another one. Lion's mane, now, I'm not experts on these, but I, I just pass on a bit of the research as I found out. Lion's mane is supposed to reconstitute neural pathways in the brain and spinal column. So apparently it helps uh, regular consumption with that over a three-month period. I actually help uh, deal with individuals with um, things like uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, uh, dementia, things like that, that because it reconstitutes uh, neural pathways in the brain with a myelin sheath. Anyways. Um, so and there's a lot of different mushrooms out there that have medicinal applications. Chaga was always listed as the king of mushroom, uh, where reishi would be number two. And then after that, there's turkey tail, there's gnocchi, there's uh, the matakis, the shiitakes, the, the uh, cordyceps, which is another one as well, um, plus lion's mane. So there's a lot of different mushrooms out there. But chaga was always considered the, the, the king of uh, medicinal mushrooms. And there's been a lot of research to back that up as well. And, and as a disclaimer, people, please do not just go out there and start picking mushrooms uh, yes. based off what you just seen Jerry hold up there because there are lookalikes and make yep. sure if you're ever doing it, you're 100 1,000% sure because uh, yeah, right. the wrong move, you could be in trouble, in trouble. Oh, yeah. 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 There's a lot of different, it takes a lot of times. 
and mycology groups are there's a lot of mushroom clubs out there well not actually there's far and few between i think the only one in southern ontario that i've ever seen was in toronto but there are a lot of people that do mushroom uh, walks and talks i talked to somebody um north of where was it uh, kingston uh they had uh they were going out plus uh, i think there's one up in halliburton as well that they do in the fall and they will they do they'll take you through the forest and show you different mushrooms which are edible and which ones to watch out for as well and even with that uh, you want to go with an expert and make sure you know what you're doing because there's a lot of ones that could be very detrimental to your health as well if you get into the wrong stuff mm -hmm. yeah, yeah for sure okay well you know what we're uh, we're closing in on 20 to 9 o'clock and uh, i did put the link in one last time there i will drop it one more time if if uh we'll take one more person for a question if interested if not we'll uh, we'll start to wrap things up but uh jerry is there anything else that uh that we might have missed that uh well there's always something I, I mean there's so many things to talk about it's hard to to make sure we get it all uh it's it's an immunomodulator so essentially um, works with your immune system. I mean, that's what a lot of the cancer stuff they're talking about now is immunotherapy. And essentially, that's what a lot of this does is it, it helps regulate your immune system. If it's overactive, it stimulates it to come down. If it's not active enough, it stimulates it to get going. And there's lots of research to, uh, to, to back a lot of that stuff up. It's just you gotta, you've got to find the right ears that are willing to listen to it. And when people are dealing with it, make sure you talk to your doctor. We're not doctors, can't give medical advice. What we do do is send you the information or the studies of what we're talking about and have you make up uh, your own decisions or talk it over with a, a healthcare professional to make sure you're doing things in your best interest. Yeah, for sure. Uh, let's see here. There's a couple of starred questions here from back in the chat that I would like to get up there just yep. to make sure they get covered. Uh, another one from our good friend Gord here asking, is it better or easier to extract the beta glu glucans? Did I say that right? Glucans? Yeah. Using chunks or powdered chaga? Well, the larger the pieces are, the harder it is to, uh, the longer it takes to extract it. The powder is easier because it's the largest bearing surface, which requires the least amount of extraction time. So, for example, we're talking about your tinctures. If you utilize a powder, uh, you, would you wouldn't have to do it as long simply because it's easier to extract it when the, when the, um, the bearing surface uh, to do the extraction from is that small. Cool. Cool. And then this is from Ontario camping couple who just, uh, I recently watched a video on their channel the other day about how they actually process chaga. Um, and it, I, I thought it was a good watch. Uh, if anybody wants to go over and check out their, uh, their growing channel, Ontario camping couple, but they're asking, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if this is serious. Can you use moonshine for a tincture? Like, you know, is, do you risk going blind? If it... Well, <laughs> it's an alcohol extraction is what they, they use. So if, uh, assuming that uh, everybody's perception of what moonshine actually is or how they make it, um, so long as it's an alcohol base. And quite frankly, the individuals or the naturopaths that I deal with or talk to, they were using a high-grade um, alcohol out of, out of the States because you can get, uh, what is it, an 80 or 90 proof alcohol to the states that they were utilizing for their tinctures because it does a better extraction. So in regards to the moonshine, can't tell you for sure. Um, I don't know the alcohol content. I don't know the basis of it. But if it's an alcohol base, I would imagine that it could be utilized for an extraction type of some type. And uh, like we said, about the peppercorn size uh, pieces um, are a good size to, to use for a tincture. And an alcohol base, let it sit, shake it up a couple times a week and let it sit for a couple months and you'll have a very strong uh, extracted base that extracts a fat soluble antioxidant out of the out of the chaga. Okay. When you're when you're making a tincture too, would you like after you've had it sit for a few months and it's really darkened up, would you pour that into like a little little squeeze bottle with a little tincture yep. dropper type of thing? Yeah, yeah, that's what they do. And um, yeah, and a lot of times um, You'll see a lot, and there, there are places you can read up about tinctures how to, to do get the alcohol out of the extraction. So there's no once it's, you, it's the alcohol is extracted, it, most people don't know. So for example, vanilla extract, real vanilla extract, yep. is actually an alcohol base. So what they do is they put the vanilla beans in, and then they put the alcohol in, and they do the extraction, and then the alcohol is naturally evaporates over a period of time, or they may use an extraction method to get the alcohol out of there. 
So all you have is the vanilla extract inside your actual vanilla extract. So oh. those are some of the way. Yeah, that's how. Uh, so how, how do you extract the alcohol out of it then? Do you um, just leave it open and gases is, out type of thing? Uh, yeah, the it'll uh, naturally evaporate out. To, there are some that you can read up on that will talk about that. I don't make tinctures. So you just don't have enough product or enough time or uh, the space to be able to, uh, to, to supply it. But uh, what we do is uh, we show people or um, – what's been passed on to us by naturopaths who are making tinctures on their own in the past. Hmm. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. You know what? I, I got this jar and I uh, guess what Dennis is making this week. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making good. myself a tincture and uh, definitely uh, going to give that a try. So a couple of three, about three months you said, and you just keep shaking and yep. uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. And then uh, like they were saying uh, about 10 drops a day. Yep. Uh, that's uh, give you a strong, uh, a boost to your system. Cool. Yeah. Cool. And you can put that over orange juice so you could have chaga tincture and orange juice. No, it's supposed to get <laughs> whatever. Okay. Uh, sure. You know what, Jerry, one last question for you. What is your favorite way to consume chaga? Um, right now during the chaga maple season, um, we have a, a spoon of a teaspoon, a tablespoon of a chaga maple every day. Yeah. Yeah, it is very high concentration of chaga in there. And people try to, well, how much chaga is in that? It's extremely difficult to try and explain how you take. Uh, so that would be, so that would be 40, so it would be 20. Uh, how you take uh, basically 600 liters of sap uh, and uh, put in a certain amount of chaga into it and, and how it makes it down to, um, so that would be 40, so that would be, uh, 14 liters of uh, from 600 to, to 14 about. And I have to figure it all out. It's probably a little bit different than that, but 40 to 1 ratio. Yeah. Well, but two and a half days in order to make them. But that's the way I have it right now. Or a lot of times, and what I do is um, I'll have it in my coffee a lot of times. I have a 12 cup percolator at home. And I will take what I call the grinds or the peppercorn size stuff, which works best for the tincture as well. Yeah. Um, is I have a take a tablespoon of that, put it in with my tw coffee percolator in that and put coffee in, just a little bit of coffee, less than normal, and let it perk for about 40 minutes. So I do a slow perk instead of a, a normal amount, I put a little bit less in and add one tablespoon of chaga in there and get it directly in my coffee. And that's uh because chaga is alkaline, coffee's acidic, so it neutralizes a lot of the acid in coffee. And that's the alkaline aspect about it could be one of the the key ways that it's beneficial to a lot of the body as well and neutralizing a lot of the acids. Yeah, that's uh, that I, I mentioned when you were, when you were doing your presentation at the uh, Toronto show there, I, I, I asked a couple questions there, of course. And I, I mentioned that that's one of my favorite ways to actually consume as well as uh, my favorite way to make coffee is just like a pour over single serve pour over type of thing. Yeah. And I'll do it with my chaga tea and I'll pour that over. And it just yeah. makes such a nice mellow coffee. Yeah, really and so good. in cases like that, Dennis, what you can do is you make a batch of tea and use that as your water. Yep. Or what you can do is if the powder, you got it down to a powder stage, and people are harvesting their own. If they use their own coffee grinder, just don't put too much in because you'll burn out the grinder. They're hard, really hard to deal with. Yep. Um, and then just put a – for a single cup of coffee, if you're using like a paper uh, filter, coffee filter, yep. put uh, one uh, half a teaspoon in with that for a quarter or a half a teaspoon – and the pour alone will extract enough out of it in the powder stage to get the benefit directly in your coffee. Nice. Nice. Okay. I'm going to have to try that too. Yeah, sure. definitely. definitely. So many different ways you can, uh, you can do this. Um, a couple of people are just posting last second questions. Do you, do you have time, Jerry? Yeah, sure. I'm good. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kill Quest is asking, can you just recap on how many times you can brew chaga chunks? Okay. So what I usually suggest to people to do is, you take about 40, 40, 50 grams of chunks, uh, both with the, the dark exterior, okay, this part here, and some of the chunks have it in here, about the size of a walnut or an acorn nut sort of thing, and put it in a crock pot, a large crock pot. Let it steep in cold water overnight, and usually um, not tap water. You don't want chlorinated water. If you can use spring water is the best. Um, and let it steep in cold water overnight. And then the next day, turn it on low for 8 to 12 hours, not boiling, and then you'll have a complete crock pot. You can do that probably two, three times full with those same chunks. 
after you've done the first batch, you can put the chunks in the fridge or in the freezer and let them freeze. Now, you won't be able to do the cold extraction, but you can do a warm extraction afterwards as well. And then take those chunks out again and reuse them. And after the second or third time in the crock pot, they'll be soft enough. You can cut them in halves or quarters and get another time or two out of them again. So it all depends on how many, uh, how long you steep it, how big the chunks are, et cetera, et cetera. But that's an approximation of the benefits you get with using the chunks. Hmm. Use it as much as you can, however you can. Get the most out of this stuff, yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't know about the, the water and the alcohol extractions. That they, they were two different type of things, so that, that's cool. So long as you're getting color out of your chunks, you're getting a benefit out of them. Yeah. And then uh, Mujin Bojwala, who's uh, got here a little late, was asking what the benefit of this, what of what is the benefit of this tincture? Sleep, anxiety, depression, etc. Are there any of those? Well, it's an immunomodulator. So I have some individuals that uh, claim to utilize it for sleep purposes because there's no caffeine in it at all. Yeah. Uh, depression, no. I have uh, individuals that some individuals see if your systems aren't working right, there could be other causes. So what this does is because it's an immune modulator, it reg helps regulate your immune system. If it's overactive, it stimulates it to come down. If it's not active enough, it stimulates it to get going and gets your systems working the way they're supposed to. So that's how it works with diabetes and things like that in, in trying to ensure that your pancreas is producing the way it should be and working and producing insulin and the other aspects. And although not specifically for those areas, a lot of inflammation would probably be the biggest aspect that it eliminates is inflammation in the body allows the body to heal itself. And those are some of the key ways that are really beneficial to people. Cool. And we'll do one very last one here before we call it an evening. Whatever you want. Sam Jackson's a, he's back on the, on the coffee one, how the coffee neutralizes the alkaline in the chaga. Does that affect the effect of chaga? No, we haven't seen anything. And uh, if you recall, I don't know if you were on earlier when I was talking about my friend Doug. Um, Doug, uh, which is the blood bone cancer, bladder cancer, arthritis, and was diabetic. Doug was a coffee drinker. So what I would do would be I would make a batch of tea for him, and quite frankly, a strong dose. And then I would fill up his reservoir on his Keurig, and he would get it directly in his coffee. And that's the way he drank it all the time, was in the coffee through with the chaga and it neutralized both cancers, eliminated the arthritis and stabilized his blood sugar. And I can tell you that uh, his blood sugars were, were rather severe. And when they came down, they came down substantially. So he used it in there and had, that was one of the first ones that decided me to, that there was some legitimacy to this in the first place, that this is helping a lot of people and this we are seeing. So I don't believe that the negative aspects of the uh, acidity in the coffee is going to negatively affect the uh, benefits of chaga. Awesome. There you go. Well, Jerry, you know what? Thanks very much for sharing all your wisdom with us tonight, man. This is, uh, like I say, I, I, I love chaga personally. Uh, I thought it would be a great topic. Uh, I thank Ingo Hetzer for actually setting the two of us up here at the, the Toronto show uh, to speak about it and to have you uh, agree to be on the show has been a benefit. As well as, thanks very much for your patience on last week, uh, having to postpone the show. Uh, my, no that was my bad. It really was. <laughs> it's all right. Things happen, you know. We just got to we do the best we can with what we have to work with. Listen, Dennis, I really appreciate being on the show. Uh, it's great. To, it's good that you're getting messages out like this. People have questions. You want to ask me a question, don't be afraid to email me. I don't have a problem. And um, if you check our website, a lot of the times right now, I think uh, – Saturday mornings, I'm doing the Peterborough Farmer's Market. That's about all right now. But later on, I'm in Lindsay and Millbrook. And where else do my uh, Lindsay, Millbrook, and Lakefield uh, are the key ones I'll be doing through the summer. And then in the fall, I'll be doing a number of shows as well. But if people have questions or want to try it, because uh, what we do is we have samples uh, at the places we go to, let people try it and let it taste them on their own, get a little bit of a surprise. Because it don't yeah. taste like it looks like, does it, Dennis? No, man. Yeah, like I said, it's got very mild vanilla notes. Uh, yeah. It's got a creaminess if it's really dark. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, uh, I, enjoy it, it. I enjoy it. And if it's really bitter, then uh, be cautious. Yeah, you haven't cleaned the bird crap off it. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jerry, thanks once again. Um, you know what? I'm just going to drop you into the basement. So everybody knows uh, there is a link to uh, Jerry's website, which is uh, Chaga Health and Wellness. 
And that is uh, the link is in the description below. So if you want more information or if maybe you want to see if you can order some Chaga product off of him, um, when, when is uh, when's your new batch of uh, this going to be available? Uh, I don't have that online. Uh, okay. I only sell it at events um, okay. because I don't have enough. Now, not only that, but the shipping costs would be so high for that. Yeah, it would be very problematic for me to ship. But uh, I make arrangements for a lot of people. We have we have a number of locations that retail our products, and people who pick them up there on a, on a basis as well. Yeah, heck, I, I might have to make a drive to Oshawa. Or when my my wife's driving through, maybe I'll have to have her stop and pick. Let me know up. when you're coming through. <laughs> For sure. Thanks, Jerry. I'm just going to drop you into the basement to close out the show, and then uh, I'll see you in the green room in a few moments. Okay. Thanks, Thanks again. again. All righty. Well, you know what? I hope everybody really enjoyed tonight's show. Uh, you know what? Uh, doesn't always have to be about canoe paddling and hiking and stuff like that. Uh, stuff like this uh, as an outdoor uh, type of thing is uh, always a welcomed, in my opinion, anyways, a welcome topic to uh, to bring up. Anyways, uh, just a few reminders. Um, I mentioned it at the top of the show. Next week, next Tuesday evening, that is April the 12th, please mark it on your calendars and please plan to attend the show because next week we are celebrating our 100th episode over three years of uh, of running Canoe Hounds Outdoor Adventure Show. Uh, it's just going to be more of a, a festive evening, a party. I'm going to have on a, uh, a appearances from a bunch of past guests and stuff like that. I'm just going to flow through the evening. I'm going to be joined by Kevin Callen as well there. He's going to, he's probably going to have to take over the reins after a while. If, uh, if I switch to the top shelf stuff that I have over above my head here that you can't really see off screen, but, uh, it's going to be a, a night of celebration. Plus we have over a thousand dollars worth of swag to give away. And you have to watch the show to know how to actually enter the draw. Okay, there's going to be something uh, special. It's not even going to be a skill testing question or anything like that. But uh, you're going to need to watch the show to know exactly how to, uh, to to enter. We've got packages from Kid Products. We've got cat pack, a package from Algonquin Outfitters, uh, Nova Craft Canoe, Hunter and Harris Paddles, of course, Canoe Hound Adventures, and uh, a bunch of other little things going on that are going to just make this a fun night. So, everybody, I hope to see you all next week. Have yourselves a fantastic week, and as I always say, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep the adventures alive. Have a great week. Cheers.